we knew that they had left Lhasa and we knew there was trouble going on in Lhasa but that's all we knew our two agents Atar and Lhotse were their Tibetan name we always called them Tom and Lou Atar and Lhotse they're the two man radio team one of these teams that we had trained and equipped with the radio and had already been dropped by parachute back into Tibet. The radio teams transmitted their messages direct from Tibet to Washington. And then Washington sent the messages direct back to Tibet. What? We sent a message to them from Washington saying, go find the Dalai Lama and let us know where he really is. And they met up with the Dalai Lama's party south of Lhasa in the mountains. That was the first time we had a concrete location for the Dalai Lama and we gave it to the people preparing the president's briefing so we could say this is where he is now. And the president of the United States found this extremely interesting you see. They knew that he hadn't been killed by the Chinese, he hadn't been captured by the Chinese, all of these things the press had been speculating about. There's always been a very high level of international interest, media interest, in the Dalai Lama. He's sort of a romantic figure, you see. And word was spread by the Chinese themselves that the Dalai Lama had fled or had disappeared from Lhasa. The Chinese announced from Beijing that the Dalai Lama had disappeared. And the, the media, the press, all over the world became extremely interested in where is the Dalai Lama? What's happened to the Dalai Lama? There's all kinds of speculation. Maybe he had been shot by the Chinese. Maybe he just plain fled. Maybe he was died of disease. All kinds of speculation. You know. This was an ongoing story. Where is the Dalai Lama? The Dalai Lama, warmly greeted by Mao Zedong five years ago as he arrived in Beiping, together with his rival, the Panchen Lama, to acknowledge Red China's overlordship. Beiping, by treaty, assured Tibet autonomy. In effect, recognizing on paper the temporal leadership of the Dalai Lama over three million Buddhist Tibetans. Two years ago, the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama toured Buddhist shrines together. Now, in the wake of the Tibetan uprising, a repetition of Hungary's brief revolt, the Dalai Lama is a fugitive, stripped of power by red decree. The Panchen Lama, thought to be a Chinese pawn, is his successor. Reportedly, the Dalai Lama was injured while fleeing to sanctuary in India. Some say he is leading rebel holdouts in southern Tibet. At the least, Red China has suffered a severe loss of face. But there are no free newsmen to bring out the true story of the hungry of Asia from behind the bamboo curtain. was wondering where the Dalai Lama was. Well, we knew where he was, fortunately, because the two guys had gone in had been trained in radio uh, communications. Of course, that was a great coup in Washington. They had to develop telecodes and so forth so they could communicate and uh, were able to get a Mongolian monk who devised the telecodes for them. Gishi Wangyo was his name. And he lived up in Freehold, New Jersey. And he would come down and get to the safe house and then I would meet him there. 
I would take this message typed out in telecodes to Gishi, and then he would translate the Tibetan to English. I mean, this is how many steps there were in it. The radio messages told us where they were and what was going on and whether they had encountered any firefights or anything like that. And then we kept tracing him his route, the progress that he kept making. You heard about the movie that they made? Which one? The one that they made of the flight of the Dalai Lama. The guys had a movie camera with them and they'd photograph the whole flight out. This was the best that was available to document what was going on on the ground. And that was, of course, how they found the Chaikom planes chasing the Dalai Lama. There was always a great fear that the Chinese army would capture him. And if they had captured him during an effort to actually escape, there's literally no telling what they would have done with him. The Chinese became so incensed by the Dalai Lama getting away that they then started sending every available army unit they could squeeze out. Even though the distances were not huge, I mean, Lhasa is only, I think, 150 miles north of India or something like that. But it's very mountainous territory, and there was only one road, and the Chinese army was occupying the road. So they went out far to the east, would put them through much higher mountains and all that, and it took longer. But it was safer. One of the Dalai Lama's great concerns was whether or not he would be allowed to live in India. You see, this was by no means certain that the Indian government would let him stay in India. The Chinese army was much stronger than the Indian army in those days, and the Indians didn't want to stir up any trouble with the Chinese. <laughs> I went down and picked up the message and took it back to Gishi at the safe house. The message said that the Dalai Lama requested asylum from the Indians. I mean, Gishi was shaken that he was so enraptured by the fact that we were talking about his holiness. So at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> here I'm calling the chief of the division and telling him, and he says, well, great, send, send the message to New Delhi and see what they can do. And within 24 hours of the original message that they sent to us, we had gotten approval from Nehru for the asylum. <laughs> But I and I should